Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I'm Neil Lane. I'm a fellow here at the Baker Institute, and my job is a very pleasant one. It's to welcome you to the Baker to Rice and the Baker Institute and to this very timely discussion today on the challenge of communicating uh, climate change, which the Baker Institute is pleased to be co-sponsoring with Rice's Center for Studies of the Environment and the Society Science and, and with the innovation team from the British Consulate General, Houston. And I especially want to welcome our guests from abroad for making a long trip from the UK. We very much appreciate you being here for this event. Uh, in a moment, May Akrawi, uh, Counsel for the Consulate General, will, will perform the introductions. Let me just make a few remarks first. The topic, uh, I think, communicating climate change, its causes and its potential consequences, is important because while the science continues to get better, the public awareness and understanding remains unsettled. It was improving for a while and then uh, we had a bit of a reversal because of a combination of events. A very snowy winter, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, it wasn't cold everywhere on the globe, but it was where many of us live. Uh, that's not inconsistent with global warming or with the models, but it does influence public attitudes. Second, the stolen emails that are widely publicized that made some scientists look, I guess, mean and maybe even anti-scientific, and certainly some of those emails were unfortunate and uh, at least you could say defensive in their tone. Third, several actual errors that, appear, that appeared, words and phrases that were not in the end based on peer review science, uh, but nonetheless appeared in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, the IPCC report, and the IPCC certainly will be tightening up its procedures to try to make sure those mistakes don't happen. I'm not aware of any comprehensive scientific report that doesn't have some kind of error in it. Uh, these are complex, uh, and uh, still, any error can cause you problems. You don't want errors in scientific reports, even if, they're, uh, even if they are summaries or, uh, in, in their nature. Moreover, I think, for public attitude, this comes at a time when the country's economic recession, much of the world's economic recession, um, government bailouts, other kinds of unpopular things, have distracted people and tended to reorder their priorities when they're asked questions in surveys. And I think uh, the scientific community was unprepared to respond effectively to the criticisms that it received, although several scientists have spent a good bit of their time, waking hours and sleeping hours, I think, responding to questions and concerns, some of them legitimate questions about the science, many of them the usual mean-spirited harassment that we've all come to know. Now, I often give talks on the topic of civic scientists, which is to me, the notion that scientists, in addition to doing research and making discoveries, and in many cases educating the next generation, uh, need to interact more with the public and the politicians in Washington, not just lecturing, in fact, not primarily lecturing, but having a two-way conversation. We at the Baker Institute have a civic science scientist lecture series, so this is a little commercial. Please do attend our civic scientist lectures. Today, you're about to hear from a number of civic scientists doing exactly what I said on this topic of communicating climate change. It's, it's a challenge, because even on energy, which you think people might know a lot about, they don't. So the public agenda numbers that I saw, these are survey numbers from the public agenda uh, uh, think tank, said that 40% of the American people cannot name a fossil fuel. 60% 60% cannot name a renewable. Almost 60% believe that nuclear power causes global warming. Almost a third of the American people believe that solar energy causes global warming. Well, <laughs> okay. So it's easy, to, it's easy to get the words confused, and I'm, and I'm not saying these things to be critical of the public. I'm saying these things to suggest we really have a big issue. 
Uh, so we have civic scientists with us today, and I want to introduce uh, Dr. May Akrawi of the British Consulate General, who will introduce the panel and its moderator. May. Thank you, Neil, for this kind introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Her Majesty's Consul uh, for Science and Innovation at the British Consulate General, and I'm joined here by our Deputy Consul General Andrew Price and uh, Mitch Jeffrey, our Vice Consul for Press and Public Affairs. So, at the Consulate, we are very much part of a team um, that works to represent the UK in the Southwest States, and uh, Catherine and I in the science section represent the Foreign Office's Science and Innovation Network, um, and we're part of a team of 15 science attaches in the US, really recognizing uh, the partnership that we have in the US in science and technology, and the potential for collaboration and uh, sharing best practice in, in science, technology, and policy, um, and about 100 of us worldwide. Um, and on the policy side in Houston, we really can ask for no better partner than the uh, science technology program at the Baker Institute, uh, led by Neil Lane and Kirsten Matthews. And it's really been a great pleasure working with the Baker Institute now for uh, six years, and especially on the science technology policy, where we uh, focus more of our work. And we're indeed fortunate to have partners like yourself Neil, that share the same values and interests that we have in science policy and also communication of science policy covering the civic science uh, program. And I do recommend attending that. I think it's an excellent program. And uh, we've worked with uh, the Baker Institute on four stem cell policy events, uh, most recently in September, as well as our event last year to launch the Royal Commission of Environmental protection report discussing the potential effects of environment, um, the impact of nanomaterials on the environment, and uh, of course Rice, Rice University um, has, is very well known for its, its role in uh, this area. I also want to thank members of the um, Baker Institute staff who really helped to organize this, along with Catherine Santa Maria of my team. And these are Dr. Kirsten Matthews, Whitney Smith, Alex Ferber, and many others who I, um, I don't know, but, but work really behind the scenes to make this very seamless. And I do want to thank Neil for hosting this and to Dr. Andre Droxler for uh, helping us organize this and also agreeing to moderate this. So in a world where science plays a key role more than ever in our everyday lives, and impacts our everyday life decisions, I think it's even more important now uh, to have the type of discussion that we're holding today. I mean, most scientists, and I include myself in this when I was um, in the lab, are not natural communicators. We focus our energy on our research and can often get subsumed by it and not really pay enough attention to the way we are communicating or not, in some cases, our results to those whom it will impact most and those who have to make decisions based on them. So with communication now becoming so widely available, first through the printed press in my days and now with the internet and especially the expansion of social media uh, and the way and timing of how we convey science, it has changed <coughs> dramatically. I'm not sure if we have evolved our communication of science to parallel these new developments in the same way. As consumers, citizens, and parents, we need more information. As our understanding of science has become more sophisticated, we need to know about nutrition, safety of our food, purity of our water, the air we breathe, as well as the medicines and vaccines that we take and give our children. And this was highlighted most recently with the concerns that parents had about the H1N1 vaccine. And how are we supposed to make these decisions when there is so much conflicting information out there? Um, so the scientific community have a way of evaluating each other's work via the peer review process and the science citation in this, to name a few. And how should the public evaluate the opinions of the multitude of experts and pundits opining on every discipline of science? Now, climate change, I think, represents a more, even more complex problem. We are facing an international problem, 
and the actions of one country is not enough to stop or slow down the rate of climate change for the rest of the world. It is an international problem that needs consensus and a sustained international program and actions. It's an area that requires policy decisions, but also voluntary decisions that we, the public, make in our everyday lives. So the mantra of reduce, reuse, recycle is one that we try to follow. And there are many decisions that will make economic sense, like energy conservation and efficiency and save us money in the long run. But there are others that don't, and these require some sacrifices on our behalf. So to take these personal and political decisions, we require a very sophisticated way of communicating science, and there's a role for scientists to play in this. But there's also a role for the media to practice responsible journalism and for policymakers to base their ma policymaking on robust scientific evidence. And the evidence of climate change isn't about the latest and possibly subjective news stories. It is about fundamental physics real observations and objective peer-reviewed science, and I'm sure you'll hear more on that from our panel. So the need for action on climate change is urgent, but that sense of urgency does not seem to come across in societal behavior. Many of us who are not taking actions consider an event in 2100 too far away for us to worry about, but climate change impacts are already being felt in many regions worldwide. And as an example, we felt this in Europe in the 2003 heat wave, which killed an additional 35,000 people in Europe, 2,000 of them in the UK. By the 2040s, Europe will consider such a summer normal, and by the 2060s, it will be considered cool. And the US Global Change Program published a report in June of last year, which covered everything from drought in the southwest to melting, snowpack and glaciers, and as well as sea level rise, which also has a large impact on storm surges from extreme event, which we feel every season here in Texas. So the experts on this panel have come from different backgrounds and have all been involved in communication of climate science to the public in some way and the other, and to the media and policymakers. There is a difference, however, that you'll notice in the way they communicate science, somewhat depending on the type of organization they represent, and I'll let them expand on this in their discussion. So it is finally my great pleasure to introduce today's panel to you and also thank them for traveling from the UK to speak at the Sea Level Rise Conference in Corpus Christi that uh, we attended this week and stay for this panel. So I'll start with, uh, um, first I'll start with our moderator, Andre Draxler. So Andre is a professor at Rice University's Department of Earth Sciences and the director of the University Center for the Study of Environmental Society, which is co-sponsoring today's event. I won't read you all their biographies, but I'll let you look at them in greater detail. I'll mention he is an oceanographer by discipline and a Texan with a very funny accent. But he has been here <laughs> since the 80s, I think, Andre. Um, <laughs> Andre is, is uh, currently on sabbatical at Exxon in the research section there. And I'm also told that he and Mark Maslin, one of our panelists, uh, first met on the island of Lesbos and was assured that it was for a very genuine academic conference. <laughs> but I'll let them tell you more about that if they wish. I would uh, start by introducing the UK scientist with David Vaughan. David is the science leader of the British Antarctic Survey, and he's, uh, his program is on studying ice sheets and their past and future changes. And he's currently coordinating a very large ice to sea major European funded program involving researchers from 24 institutions, which will deliver global sea level rise projections for the next 200 years. And David has been to Antarctica about seven seasons. David is also a coordinating lead author for the 2007 IPCC report on climate change and was recently awarded the Polar Model by Her Majesty the Queen. David has been to Antarctica for seven seasons and so far, uh, so far and has missed going this year, but his close affinity to ice led him to go skiing in Canada last week where he fell and suffered a dislocated shoulder 
So we're very, very grateful that he still managed to make it here and actually went through all his obligation. And this did not diminish his love for ice in the, sli in the least. His friend, we were told, who was skiing with him, realized, only realized that David was seriously injured when in a typical understated English way, he got up and said, that hurt. <laughs> he put his shoulder back in and I think continued downhill till he finally got some medical attention. And I'm, I also promised to say that David was actually on a double black diamond ski slope when that accident happened. <laughs> I was alive. Was <laughs> I tried. <laughs> yes, as he fell down to maintain his image, um, uh, you know. So I, I promised to say this to maintain his image as a heroic Antarctic explorer and glaciologist. <laughs> David is also missing next year's season to celebrate his wife's 50th birthday, and I think the danger of missing that is on par with some of the hazards that he faces in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So we're sticking with that decision. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Mark Maslin. So just flipping over here. Mark is the director of UCL's Environment Institute and head of the geography department there. He's also a fellow of the uh, Royal College of Royal College of Fellow of the Royal Society of uh, Geography and Royal Society of Arts. I hope I didn't mangle that. And I'm also proud to say that UCL, uh, where Mark is based, is my alma mater and is now fourth in the rankings worldwide. Mark is co-founder and executive director of Carbon Auditors Limited, and he's a leading climatologist with particular expertise in past, global, and regional climatic change. And his expertise, his scientific expertise, include causes of global climate change, ocean circulation, monitoring land carbon sinks, and international and national climate change policies. And Mark is also co-author of the UCL Lancet Commission on the impact of uh, global health on climate change that he will be talking about and currently working with our Department of International Development report on population, climate change, and the Millennium Development Goals. And Mark is certainly one of the most dapper university professors I have come across, but he also manages to maintain his academic credibility by walking around in tattered jeans and t-shirts most of the time. Um, he's also had his share of field work and adventures. In 2007, he took a group of high school students to the Arctic and swam in the Arctic Ocean, and in the same summer traveled to Kenya where he swam at the equator, not realizing there were crocodiles in the next pool. So I think life has been pretty sedate and dull since. Next is Tim Reeder. Tim is the Regional Climate Change Program Manager um, in the Thames region of the UK's Environment Agency. And he has 30 years of experience in the environmental field, much of it spent monitoring the, and improving the quality of the river Thames. And Tim is also an IPCC author and has been involved in climate change for 15 years and represents the Environment Agency and the London Climate Change Partnership. And his most recent project um, is one he was discussing today with the Harris County Flood District uh, Office, and that was a very interesting sharing of experience because he is the project scientist for the Thames Estuary 2100 project, which is examining the future of the Thames barrier and flood risk, flood risk management in the Thames Estuary. Tim has also had his share of adventures and stressful relationship with media outreach. Uh, you wish he hadn't told us all of this. <laughs> he told us this week that on a day when the Stern Review was launched, um, which he had not yet read, he had to follow the interviews of Lord Stern, Tony Blair, and then Chancellor Gordon Brown. And all this time, he was inside a media caravan and had to jump out, stand next to the Thames barrier, and uh, speak lucidly about the report he had not yet read. I think that went quite well. So I think I've managed to give you a little bit of an introduction on everyone. And I'll let the panel now um, give you their presentations, moderated by Dr. Druxler. So please welcome Dr. Druxler. Yes. I'll mention. <laughs> I had just one reminder, please, to silence your cell phones and all other devices that make noise. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming uh, here at the Baker Institute. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. Um, 
I'm not going to be very long. I just want to show a few, uh, a few graphs just to at least start no, kind of the, uh, the discussion that we are going to have you know, today on the challenge of the communicating you know, kind of the uh, climate change. And um, this is a very simple you know, kind of cut, not cartoon, but graphs. These are based on data. There are error bars, you know, these, these bars are you not know, kind of there. You know, are error bars are you not know, kind of there. So you can see that you no know, kind of the error bars you know, are, seems kind of to get tighter and tighter, meaning that you no know, we have better data, you know, kind of through the, the past. You know, kind of, this is you know, kind of 150 years of record by decades you know, of global average temperatures. And this is compared you know, kind of to an average. Uh, and so you can see that you no know, kind of in the past you know, kind of three decades, the 80s and 90s, and also you know, kind of the first decade of the of this century, you know, uh, the global average temperature you know have increased steadily. Um, the um, this graph you know, is from UK from Met, and it's the temperature you know, is in degrees Celsius. To be a bit more closer, you know, kind of to. Uh, to home, yes, I found you know, this wonderful website, and you can go and follow, you know, kind of this website because um, you you see you no know, kind of the, uh, the the green area is the average temperature, you know, here in Houston through the month, but even every day, yes, and so the the blue is the extreme, you know, temperature in terms of the cold one, and the, the pink one, you know, it would be the extreme in terms of the uh, the warm temperature, and as you can see, this is. 2009, last year, and most of us have lived here got it, through this very unusual warm summer. Yes, you can see that the, uh, you know, here all of this, you know, kind of the dark lines. You now this uh, are the real temperature for 2009, and you can see that most of this two month year of July, August, and September, the temperature you nowhere know, above, you know, kind of the the average. So you would think, you know, kind of this, at least, and we have to be careful, and we're going to talk about this probably, you know, at length, you know, during this afternoon, that, you know, kind of this type of local data, like Houston, might not be, you know, representing, you know, kind of the global temperature. But for instance, kind of this is, you know, from, uh, from the, the Goddard Institute, it's NASA, and um, you can also find all this website they upgrade them you know, on a monthly, on a yearly, but also on a monthly basis. And so this is the annual mean surface temperature anomaly against it comparison to an average. And um, everything, you know, kind of in the, from the, the yellow and uh, brown would mean you no know, kind of warming uh, uh, relative to that average. And all the, uh, the blues and even the purples would be cooling. And this is for three years, you know, 2009 compared you know, to 2005 and 1998. And you can see that you know, kind of 2009, at least according you know, to, uh, to NASA, but it was also according you know, to NOAA and also you know, to uh, East Anglia, to the Met, that 2009 was you know, kind of among you know, kind of the top two or three you know, warmest you know, year in the last 150 years. So at least you know, we felt it here in Texas, but obviously you know, kind of, it's, we have to be very careful with this. But in spite you know, of, this, um, of this continuous warming, and this is the topic of this afternoon, yes, a conversation, you know, the, um, the, the percent of Americans, for instance, and this was in November, two, uh, you know, in November 2009, you know, these people believe, and I don't like you know, the term believe, but you know, we often talk, you know, about climate change, and we say, "Do you believe in climate change?" But and here it says, you know, the Amer the American people, you know, kind of dropped, you know, in terms of the belief, you know, that cl climate change, you know, was, you know, happening. So, you know, from eighty to seventy-two percent, even though at least the data, you know, seems to tell us that yes, it was still steadily warming, and uh, two thousand nine was, you know, one of the top. You know, year in terms of the gloaming, and this is even an interesting, a more interesting graph because this is from 2009 to 2010, and this is you now the the British population, kind of showing that um, you know the percent of respondent you know, on this poll, you know, kind of said that climate change was um, a reality, but you know the percent has fallen from 83 percent to 75 percent. Well, you know. 
when you hear the types of temperature Europe went through in December, January, and February, you could imagine that this could influence you know, the opinion of the British you know, population. But even in Texas, as you know, and this is kind of this wonderful website, and uh, they just you know, kind of upgrade you know, every day. You can see you know, this blue line going up and down. And you can see here, for instance, January was quite cold. It was probably you know, some of the coldest January we have had. You can see you know, kind of this dip you know, kind of there. Well within you know, the extreme cold, we had temperatures of 20, 22 degrees you know, in Houston for several, um, uh, several days. Uh, at least at night. But you can see also that we had w very warm weather at the end of January. So January is, an, in a way, in a wash in terms of average, yes. But February was rather cold. And so all of this, if you put this into a context now of, you know, kind of the monthly global uh, temperature, uh, surface temperature, you can see, you know, kind of this is, again, comparing, you know, the different uh, Januarys, 2000. Uh, 2010, 2005, and 1998. And here, you know, this January, this January was, you know, kind of the second warmest out of the last 131 years. This is according, you know, to, to NASA. So you can see, you know, kind of the, the blue part of Texas here, and you can see the very dark blue of Europe. And all of this can be explained, you know, by the atmospheric situation currently in the, uh, in the Arctic area. So, you know, it's not because, you know, it was cold in Europe and cold in, uh, in Northern Am America, but in Canada, as we know, in Vancouver, it was rather warm, you know, during the Olympics. So, but when these, you know, kind of anomalies, you know, kind of local and regional anomalies, you know, I put into a context of global, um, a, a, the global sea surf, uh, uh, surface temperatures, we are now, you know, kind of still within a warm warm trend. I was hoping that you know, we would have Februarys, and that would be very interesting. The, the warm temperature we have today is also related to El Nino, and uh, we are, you know, kind of through a very major El Nino, you know, and so it's going to be very interesting to find out what will be you know, the numbers for February. Okay. I also found a very interesting article on the topics of today. You know, this is by Susan Moser. She's the, uh, at the Institute of Marine Science in, um, in Santa Cruz, and so she had no kind of these different types of challenge. Why you know, do we have you know, kind of such challenge in communi communicating you know, climate change? You know, kind of this, the causes, yes. Uh, you know, if you see you know, kind of the result of direct pollution, the population would you know, kind of react dramatically, yes. Even when we say you know, there's large plastic areas you know, or covered you know, part of the Pacific you know, as large as twice you know, the state of Texas. This is kind of, you know, kind of as a uh, direct impact. But, you know, kind of CO2 in the atmosphere, greenhouse gases you know, are, are difficult you know, kind of to see. You know, the, uh, the immediacy and the direct, you know, experience of the in impact, you know, we, we are talking about, you know, I didn't mention it, but as probably you know, you know, we're looking at maybe in the last 100 years, you know, one degree Fahrenheit change. So these are kind of difficult you know, kind of to, to feel on a daily basis, especially if we have, you know, this variation uh, in, I just also found out that in the UK, the, um, you know, the temperature, I think, uh, this past two months was the coldest in the past 30 years. And I think the drop you know, was something in average by 1.5 degrees, quite, li quite a lot. This, um, so you know, there's no gratification, direct gratification in immediate you know, trying to mitigate you know, kind of the, uh, these problems. The, uh, most of our population and even our young generations you know, are kind of linked you know, into you know, interiors. I mean, most of my children kind of seems to spend kind of virtual reality in playing video games instead of going to play soccer outside or football. And you know, we live you know, in a world where we have luck, a lack of connection with you know, kind of the seasons, you know, the, even the weather, unless it's very extreme. And so all of this, and I don't want to go into to, to all, to all of these points, but so these are not the big challenge in terms of communicating, you know, uh, climate change. So, and this is my last, you know, kind of uh, diagrams, but, you know, or, or words, you know, kind of there, we, what do we do, you know, how can we get better at trying, you know, kind of to, to reach these different um, uh, population? 
you know, the purpose and the scope of the communication is to be clear. We have to adapt no kind of the message to the audience. We have no kind of to, to have specific message you know, to the audience. And we have also to have the right messengers. And we have this afternoon probably you know, some of the, uh, the best messengers you know, kind of to tell us about how it is hard you know, kind of to communicate you know, climate change to our society. Thank you very much. I'm not sure who is coming next. Oh, so here, please um, welcome Mark Meslin. OK, you're welcome. All right, let me just find. Ooh. So while that's loading up, I'd like to thank Neil and May and uh, Andre for their kind introduction. I'd also like to slightly expand on the story that May told you. Um, it's very nice that she thinks I'm a dapper dresser, but occasionally I do get it really wrong. I was uh, attending a meeting and hadn't realised that the provost, the head of our university, was going to be there, and I was in a Grateful Dead t-shirt. <laughs> <coughs> I hid in the back, and I hope he didn't see me. What I want to try to do today, very briefly, is try to show you the challenges of communicating climate change. And I'm going to talk about both the science and also the social science aspects of this. The first thing I want to point out is that the first thing we need to communicate to policymakers and to the public is science is not a belief system. It is a system developed from the Enlightenment. It is a logical, rational system of observation and ever evidence-based conclusions. It is not a sweet shop. You can't go in there and go, oh, I like that. Yeah, I like that piece of science. That's antibiotics. That's going to save my life. Oh, I like that piece of science. That says that a metal tube with bits that stick out can actually fly through the air and take me to Corpus Christi without any risk. Oh, but I don't like those sweets because that says HIV causes AIDS and that over there says CO2 causes climate change. I think that's the first thing we have to do. We have to say that we have a fantastic developed society based on a science and technology basis. And I think that's the first thing we have to bring. The second thing is scientists have to be able to clearly explain science to any audience. Okay? We must be able to explain climate change and the science behind it to the public media and to policy makers. If we can't do that, then the science isn't worth doing. Okay? The science is there for society to learn from and to understand the world. I actually think that iconic graphs and images are central to this. This is a wonderful graph. This is the Keeling curve, which basically shows that from 1958, when he actually persuaded his PhD supervisor that Hawaii would be a really good place to go measure CO2. <laughs> Very fortuitous, because actually it does give us an absolutely fantastic record of rising CO2 levels every single year since then. And it's this iconic nature of this graph means that no one actually comments on whether CO2 is actually increasing in the atmosphere. We have these wonderful graphs which show that both NASA, NOAA and in the UK that data sets put together over the last, for the last 150 years show that actually temperatures are rising. Again, what I find interesting about these graphs is the sceptics are very able to go, oh, look, it's going down. Except it's gone down there, it's gone down there, it went down there. Again, minor Blips, again, do not actually set a trend. And this is one of the reasons for Copenhagen that the World Meteorological Organization and the Met Office decided to try and make things even simpler and just put them into blocks of decades to actually truly show that sort of uh, um, detail, uh, uh, detail of the transition. I also had uh, great uh, sort of feelings of uh, dread coming to um, Texas, as friends of mine said, you're going to talk about climate change in Texas? <laughs> you won't be coming back, they said. Now, I'm not sure that's because they don't want me back. Or... <laughs> but this gave me great hope. This was in the um, Houston Chronicle on the 22nd of February. And very clearly, it says, scientists, 
now concluded that climate change is 99.5% certain, not 100% as previously stated. See, I told you it was a hoax. It's all a hoax, okay? So again, we can explain things. We need to explain uncertainty, okay? The key thing is that you are asking scientists to predict the next 100 years, okay? Just think about that. I'm not sure I can predict who's going to win the Soccer World Cup, okay? Now, you're expecting me to look at the possibilities of somewhere between 7 and 12 billion people in the next 90 years, how much carbon dioxide they're going to emit, and what that's going to do to the planet. However, what we can do, and I think this is where we failed to communicate, is we can do scenarios. We can actually test the future for you with models, so you have an ability to look at what the future could be like with certain actions. And these are wonderful. So these are the different scenarios. So this is Copenhagen worked, and we all loved each other, and we did lots of carbon reductions. This is the we didn't do anything and business as usual. Now here, these are the error bars because we use about 23 models from around the world. So it's not just one group that we're relying on. We're relying on experts from 23 different research groups to produce the models with their own little quirks to try and work out what the future is like. And that tells you something about the future. And it tells you that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the other greenhouse gases make it warmer. If you put more, it'll be warmer still. And you can actually then start to look at the uncertainty into future and how you can actually start to change your policies, if you so wish. But as David will say, science just shows you what could happen. It makes no debate about whether you should or shouldn't take certain policies. All it does is says, this is what the future could look like. What I want to also communicate and try to show that we need to communicate is the insidious nature of climate change. If you excuse me, I'm just going to... I'll tell you one thing, it's going to look awful on the video. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I've just put some weather up there. It could, be, it could be rainfall, it could be temperature. And again, if you squint, you can actually see the current climate and the changed climate. And that's fine, there isn't really that much difference. But... Every society has a coping zone. The infrastructure is built for a certain amount of latitude in the climate. It can cope with a certain amount of rainfall, certain temperatures. But you find in the current climate, every so often there's one of those extreme events which pushes the infrastructure beyond. For example, suddenly it gets incredibly cold in Houston and people are suddenly working out how to actually put the heating on for the first time for a couple of years. Or it could be floods in, say, London. However, what happens is, because the infrastructure doesn't change, because in our society it takes 30 years plus to change infrastructure, you find that suddenly these extreme events become more common. And really, that's what people care about. It's not the average temperature or the average sort of uh, weather. It is those extreme events that occur that really affect you and I every day. I'm going to give you an example of the super heat wave that May uh, mentioned. Yes, I know the temperatures got up to sort of the springtime in Texas, but we don't have the infrastructure to deal with it. And so... 35,000 people died unnecessarily in Northern Europe because of that heat wave, because we do not have air conditioning in old people's homes and in their, homes, uh, their own homes. But this is just to show what May was talking about. That's the 2003 uh, event. This is the model um, outcomes from a different model showing temperature rise. And that's by 2040, we'll be dealing with a summer of that uh, temperature. But you have to remember that extreme events will happen above that on a new baseline. And again, that's what we need to communicate to decision makers so they can actually look at what sort of policy they would like to take with this sort of changing background. I'll give you another example. This is from the Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies, where they have been commissioned by their government to provide them a viewpoint of the future. 
and they are looking at a one meter sea level rise in the next 90 years. Now only half of that is due to climate change. The other half is due to sinking of the delta which Bangladesh is built upon. Partly because India has dammed a number of the rivers for hydroelectricity and therefore the silt isn't making it, but also because the Bangladesh are actually extracting fresh water from the actual delta so their population has clean drinking water but that has a knock-on effect of making the actual delta sink. And this is what they've said to their policymakers will happen in the next 90 years. Wow. That's 20% of their country. Now, it means that at least policymakers there have an ability to plan and see what will happen. That's not just, unfortunately, the loss of the country, because also the areas around here will have salt intrusions and mean that agriculture is also not tenable. Right. We also need, because we need to have some solutions, we can communicate those. And you'll find that, again, there will be a difference in the talks that we're given. I'm a university professor, so therefore I have much more latitude of what I can actually discuss and what I can actually debate. And again, I think that we need to communicate solutions. If policymakers would like to make a difference, and the people wish them to do that, which is absolutely fine if they do, there have to be solutions there. So, we can communicate the opportunity. One of the most exciting facts that I know of is that 70% of the world's energy requirement for 2030 has not yet been built. Okay, just imagine. We can change the world in any way we want because 70% of that energy has yet to be built. Okay? I also think that we need to communicate uh, some of the science of the far future. Some of you may have heard of geoengineering, and I think that we need to actually communicate this in a clear way, because some of it does feel a bit science fiction-like, and some of it is, how should I put it, could be rather dangerous and rather silly. But... We need people to investigate these things so there are solutions and are ideas out there if policymakers wish to do so. I also think that we need, as scientists and as academics, to envision the future. Okay, have you noticed that green cars are really, really ugly? We have this big problem in Europe. You know, we have some beautiful cars. So, of course, this is a group of friends of mine in Oxford who are building a hydrogen powered Morgan. Okay? Now, if green cars all look like that, do you know what? I have one. Okay? Again, I, I don't believe that hydrogen power is the way to future, but it means that you can show people that actually the world in the future is not going to be a worse place. It can be a better place, and actually you can look better. Right. Academics can also think the unthinkable, and that's what our role in society can be on occasions. Are there areas in the future that will be too dangerous to the population and we must abandon? And most of you will recognise that this is New Orleans. Okay? Again, think about that. Academics can think that. Policy makers can never mention it, but academics can actually think these things. Also, I think the role of academics is to communicate the ethics and moral issues surrounding climate change. I work with a lot of excellent academic lawyers anthropologists and philosophers at UCL. They are challenging us to look at climate change not as just a science issue, not just a technology issue, and not just an energy issue, but actually perhaps it is an ethical or moral issue that we need to communicate better to the population. So for example, the poorest and those who have con contributed least to climate change, of course, will always be the first affected. We've seen this with any extreme events. It's always the poor people that suffer. Okay. Again, the carbon footprint of the poorest 1 billion people is about 3% of the world's total. However, we know that loss of life predicted in Africa will be 500 times greater uh, than anywhere else due to climate change. So, I'll leave you on the thought that communicating climate change is about how we explain the science clearly, 
we do not gloss over the sort of uh, the uncertainties because we are trying to predict what will happen in the next hundred years. And I think some people forget that that's actually a real tall order. We need to be able to communicate that we have some moral and ethical issues, but also that science has always provided the solutions for modern society. So at some point, we'll go back to the scientists and actually try to actually find what technologies and what adaptations we will require. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. And now David is going to come and give you know, his uh, introduction. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I had my sling. This is the first day I've really had my sling off. So if I put my hand in my pocket, it's not disrespectful. It's just that it hurts a little still. Um, it's actually very difficult to talk about communication. And um, here I'm going to talk about communication and climate change science because I am a scientist and I try hard to limit myself to science. But it's very hard to talk about communication without either sounding, well, I'm not going to say patronising, but simplistic, or you end up focusing on examples of bad practice, and then you're just doing in your colleagues. Um, so what I thought I would do is just talk, give a couple of examples, but then give you a couple of the, uh, the touchstones that I use in my own communication with, uh, with the general public, with policy makers, um, which I think helps and which I think should be more widely adopted by scientists. Um, I should say a little bit about my background. One of the things that I do is lead this project, Coordinate Ice to Sea, which is a European project, a 10 million euro project over the next four years to predict sea level rise. So all I'm really saying here is that sea level rise is my expertise as a scientist. And the other areas of climate change, I'm actually uh, an observer in the same way that many other people are. Because this is now a very big area and, and scientists can't hope to be on top of the science that's coming out in all areas. I was a member of the IPCC. I was a member of the Working Group 2 of the IPCC, uh, where I led the writing of a chapter on the polar regions, the impacts of climate change in the polar regions. So if you want to talk about the IPCC and its function, which parts of the IPCC are led by the scientists, which are led by the... I can give you the lowdown. Um, I've talked, I've been working in this area of science now since 1985. And I've actually given an awful lot of talks, and many of them were sort of flood warning, be aware. The debate has moved on, and in many respects, the primary role, I think, of the scientist that, over the last two decades, which was to highlight this potential catastrophe for humanity, um, it, is, uh, is actually diminishing. The debate, the issues are firmly on the table and really this is now up to the policy makers and our own democratic processes to decide what we are going to do about it. And the number of times that I give talks to the outside public, um, I talk a lot to general interests groups, where they say actually we know this, we know this science. We've seen temperature records from ice cores. You've shown us you know, on the television. We've seen these curves for many times. What we want to do now and what we want to discuss with you is what we can do about it, as personally, and what we can expect our politicians and policymakers to do about it. I think truly the, the, in the UK, I noticed this first in New Zealand about four or five years ago, but the UK is now catching up and Europe is there as well. I, I'm very pleased to see that when we were in Corpus Christi, a lot of these, you know, the discussion was on the same uh, level. Um, I think there are some subtleties of climate change and things that we really are benefit from focusing on. This diagram is intended to show how atmospheric climate change and sea level rise affect different areas of our policy decisions. Um, atmospheric 
climate change speaks directly to this mitigation debate. Should we reduce carbon emissions or not as a planet, as a global population? Sea level rise actually, in a sense, is often used by politicians because it's very graphic and you can see uh, pictures of flooded cities and things like this. But actually, in terms of the mitigation debate, I actually see sea level rise as quite ineffective. In a sense, the emissions that we make of carbon dioxide over the next few decades are going to have little direct effect on the sea level rise that we see over the next century. A lot of the sea level rise is in the system. We must live with it. And therefore, it speaks much more directly to the adaptation debate. And there I mean global adaptation. How do we adapt our own cities and our own coastlines, which Tim will talk more about today? Uh, how do we assist the third and developing world in adapting to their changing circumstances? Um, sea level rise doesn't, doesn't speak so much to mitigation. And atmospheric climate change, warming if you like, the reason I, I've drawn a thin line down to adaptation is because, to a large extent, we don't know exactly what climate parameters we're going to be dealing with, what we're going to be trying to adapt to. In the UK, we believe that we will have increased precipitation in southern England. Now, if that comes in the winter, it fills the reservoirs up and great. You know, that's, that's fine. If it comes in the summer, it's all lost to runoff and transpiration and we still need to build more reservoirs for a growing population. So actually the subtlety there of just whether the seasonal changes of precipitation come in the summer or the winter has a huge effect on how we adapt to that precipitation change. The seasonality of temperature change, for instance, or the regionality of temperature change is something that is actually beyond our current models to predict. It won't always be beyond our models to predict. Maybe in 10 or 20 years we will have those models that have some skill at the regional level, at the seasonal level, and precipitation and all of those other climate variables. Um, clearly science is under threat, or under attack, let's say, at the moment, and it's interesting to sort of look back and think when this actually started. I believe for myself, to some extent, it was just before the COP15 meeting last year in Copenhagen that scientists, uh, science really seemed to become under threat in the media. And I think one of the reasons, the root causes of that, is that science became the science, the science, the outcomes of the science, became seen as being almost linked inevitably to a certain policy outcome for mitigation, carbon, mono, uh, carbon dioxide emissions reductions. And actually, I don't believe that that's an inevitability. I do believe in climate change. I believe the temperatures are going to go up, and that is inevitable. But I don't think that our policy response should be seen as inevitable. Even Gordon Brown recently said you know, this in a speech that the science demands this response. Well, actually... I'm not sure it does. In every case, um, a policy response, I think I've got a little bit out of, out of sync here, a policy response can only be justified from the standpoint of cost-benefit analysis and uh, you know, to, to society as a whole and justice to the individual. So, you know, we must look at science as maybe, uh, and the science of climate change as a root impetus for policy, but it does not dictate a single policy outcome and if we can disconnect as scientists that um, understanding and acceptance of science uh, the science of climate change from an apparent inevitability of some specific policy outcome we might actually increase the acceptance increase the understanding and that would certainly improve people's chances of adapting even if mitigation takes some time to come and perhaps never comes at all so I've actually strayed into my little catchphrases for myself. Firstly, I think the credibility of a scientist is reduced when he or she implies that the science supports a particular policy outcome, policy response. Scientists, I think, are actually uniquely bad at thinking about policy outcomes. We are one trick ponies. We, are, we focus on one issue and we would like to see 
a solution to that mm. issue. We don't see the wider picture. And Tony Blair said when he was Prime Minister that climate change was the biggest issue that faced humanity in the 21st century. Well, all the other issues are still there. You know, we still have global poverty, we still have um, uh, religious conflict and uh, mutual misunderstanding, uh, we still have a population explosion. All of those things remain. Climate change feeds into each and probably makes each worse. Oh, and then we, can't, we keep starting wars as well. That's bad news. <laughs> None of those things have gone away and climate change does interact with them, but I don't actually believe it is the biggest issue facing us for the future. So that was my first thing. Uh, the second thing I have actually covered already. My last thing is that you know, it is a view that many scientists hold that we need to educate the public and the policy makers around the issues of uncertainty and around our science. And I actually think we need to go halfway towards understanding what it is they want. Interesting that, you know, I talked to Tim Reader from the Environment Agency many years ago, and I was actually surprised by some of the questions he asked. They weren't the ones that I'd expected. I'd been sitting in my, well, in my Antarctic tent uh, and maybe maybe the questions aren't always the ones we think. And I, it, this really does require a dialogue. And a require a dialogue doesn't always mean the scientists standing by behind the podium telling people what the data shows. It's, this is actually us understanding what people need to know as well. Um, I have a final slide which encapsulates everything that I want to say. Um, in my household, the policy maker is very, very clear, and the scientist is the scientist. And in this case, the policy maker is looking down the road into the future. The, uh, sorry, the scientist is looking down the road into the future. The policy maker's got her eyes firmly on the media camera. <laughs> Remember, this is a left-hand drive, right-hand drive car, so she's driving. <laughs> now, this is this is about the scientist's warning of impending danger in the road giving the policymakers time to adjust. I mean, they may have their eyes on the camera and we may run headlong into the pothole. Um, but this, the most dangerous thing here would be if the scientists were to grab the wheel. And that's scientists trying to hijack the science to promote their own policy agenda. That's the most dangerous thing that can happen. And thank you, I will end with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And now, Tim, a reader, and he's our last speaker. And after this, we will have you know, a time for a long, long, at least long enough discussion. Uh, right. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today and uh, to um, uh, tackle my, some of my colleagues. I've got slightly different views, perhaps. Uh, we shall see. Uh, first challenge is to get this thing to come up. Oh, here we are. Well, Andre uh, already uh, covered this issue, but I think it is worth pointing out the seriousness of climate change, and perhaps in contrast to David's uh, emphasis, uh, the UK has passed its Climate Change Act, which requires the UK to reduce its emissions by 80% um, by 2050. It also requires the UK to carry out a risk assessment for the, on the impacts of climate change. Now, the politicians, all three parties, have agreed on that, essentially. And they haven't done that for no reason. They've done that because it is a very serious issue. And that if we don't reduce our emissions, we will end up with very severe temperature change and very severe effects. So I think that's worth saying. Coming back to the scepticism, and this, this is a difficult issue. I've been engaging in climate change for donkey's years. And it still amazes me when I talk to people in the golf club I'm a climate change scientist, I, I look after the future of the Thames Barrier, but when I talk to my average person in my four ball, you know, the other three opinions in the four ball are, ex are exactly the same weight as mine. So, you know, it's, it seems to be an interesting issue that everybody's got their very uh, firm views about. But um, going back to the survey on uh, opinions in the UK, I think a lot of that was driven by the latest cold winter, and this is just to emphasise what Andrew said, um, January 2010, analysed by the Americans, not by our dodgy scientists in East Anglia, 
was uh, uh, the fourth warmest on record. And that was because, essentially, um, we had a bit of an anomaly here in, in, in Asia and in the US. In, but you can see, as he said, Canada was pretty warm and the rest of the Southern Hemisphere was warm. So uh, you can see here the Southern Hemisphere was pretty warm, whereas we weren't so warm. But it basically just emphasised what he was saying. Uh, just because it's cold here doesn't mean to say we've got rid of climate change. So climate change, uh, what I suppose I'm saying is very difficult to persuade everybody. Um, but the solutions to climate change, the need to reduce energy demand, the need to reduce water demand, the need to make your country uh, greener, the need to look after your wildlife, uh, the need to do all sorts of things, of sensible things to do anyway. So maybe we should just persuade, you know, persuading ourselves to be more sustainable and less worried about the climate change thing. Um, and I think this, this cartoon I'm going to show you sort of sums it up. Um, so, saying the same thing. <laughs> what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Yeah. So perhaps we can address it from that end. But then moving on to the sort of nitty-gritty part of it, what I do, which is uh, trying to protect London, working with my team in the Environment Agency, trying to protect London from the effects of storm surge. This is the Thames Barrier facing out to sea, seas this way, London's that way. And it's there basically to stop storm surges going into London. And it's raised like that, um, keeps the water, high water levels out of London when we need to. And it was built in 1984 and it's been used 100, well I thought I was about to give the lecture last week saying it's been used 114 times since then. But last week they used it another five times. So it's been used 119 times to protect London. And I'm on this project looking at the future of it to work out how we're going to adapt that structure and everything else to cope with sea level rise. And I won't dwell on this, it's a bit techy, but I thought I'd just show it to show you the range of change that we're looking at. This is the, on the x-axis, the maximum water level rise. So this is a one in a thousand year storm now. Um, and this is what it might change by one, two, three, four meters. Um, so we've been looking at some very uh, severe scenarios just to make sure we thought within a big enough envelope of change and we've developed d adaptable routes involving things such as uh, flood storage or improving the defences or a new barrier to get us from where we are now to a future where we might have two or three metres change. Um, that gives us some comfort having done that analysis and having those pathways we feel we can cope with whatever is thrown at us and when we add the science back in which we've been running through the same project this confirms much as David was saying the most likely level of change is around about a meter so the good news is we can cope with this route which we were recommending or perhaps this route easily by the 2100 and the worst case is very very unlikely and it's going to be no worse than about 2.7 meters so we, we're still confident we can cope with these three options by the end of the century. So that's a flexible, adaptable, practical approach. And this is nitty gritty and relevant to lots of other countries where we sh shared this approach, the Dutch, uh, uh, Jakarta, New York, and we've been talking about the Ike Dyke today. I'm not a technical expert on the Ike Dyke and I'm not saying we need it, but anyway, <laughs> but in discussing that. Um, so making it real, uh, to actually make change, you need to have leadership. Leadership at all level, levels. Leadership at community level, higher levels, top level. And it's no accident that Barack Obama went to uh, Copenhagen. That shows some real leadership. And um, I've read I'm name dropping a bit here, but this is me showing uh, the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, nice chap, um, uh, what we need to do with the Thames Barrier. This was at the launch and the point about this, this was at the launch of the London Climate Change Adaptation Strategy, which was, and that has been the result of a lot of lobbying over the years, and has ended up with the um, mayor having a duty to produce an adaptation strategy. And he was launching this in August uh, 2008, I think, and the latest versions are now on his website. So it's important to interrelate to people, make things real, and talk as much as possible, dialogue. Um, and then last but not least, how are we actually going to persuade people of anything? Well, the, I've been working with a European project called ESPAS, which is 
not a medium-sized Renault, but a complicated name for a European project. But anyway, a, part, a big chunk of that project was behaviour change. And if you're going to get behaviour change, it concluded essentially, it, if you're going to get people to change their behaviour, you need three, three A's. One is awareness of climate change. The other is association. In other words, people won't do things on their own. They need to fill in a group. And the other is agency. If, you, know, you need to tell people what they can actually do. It's, not, it's no good making people aware if they don't know what to do. So this is a good example where in London we've uh, looked at the impacts of climate change and given guidance as to how you can change your home to adapt to flooding, overheating, water stress and retrofit your home to make it better. And we're integrating this with a large retrofit programme going across London that Boris is driving... <coughs> It's mainly, to do, it's mainly there to reduce emissions, but we're building this in as well, trying to... And that programme will uh, involve visits to over 250,000 homes in all 33 boroughs in London. And uh, it will be give easy measures for householders and good advice. We've already had the pilots working, and this is where I think agency and associations working. Because the, the thing that's going really down really well is we're giving everybody smart meters, which are things you clip on your, your main electricity wire and give you an immediate reading uh, as to what, how much using, <coughs> electricity you're using. And all sorts of communities, raising from the posh Brits to our immigrant communities, are all out in the streets saying, gee, you know, have you realised what my blasted son's doing in the shower? You know, I've worked out that this bulb uses ten times more energy than that one. And there's a huge debate going on in communities. So I think this is a good example of where you're getting, getting the message out into communities, giving some people some relevance to the issue. So I think that's, that's how I'd end up. We need to make it practical and get on with it. So thanks very much. Okay. So we will pursue now kind of the event you know, by uh, question and answer session. Um, the audience is small enough. I think that you might be able to ask your question without microphone. Is that we will try? You no, know, uh, do do speak. You know, kind of loudly if you have a, a light voice. Also, you know, if you could just ask a fairly short questions, please. You no, know, don't spend you know kind of the next ten minutes you not know, to ask your questions because we will have you know some limitation on how many questions we, you might be able to to address. We have an excellent. You know, group of people. They are global. They are from UK, but they are global, as we can see, in terms of their interest and uh, and their science and technology. So, I think we have already one question. Yeah, there. I'll try to keep it short. I guess I'll take I'll take it one step at a time. Um, as far as communicating climate change, I think we need to take a playbook from the medical field. All right, my years and. Uh, my early years in the clinics as a third year medical student, we were taught to explain things uh, simply. For example, a patient comes in with congestive heart failure. We don't say you have congestive heart failure because you have an increased preload and increased afterload. Your ejection fraction is low. No, you say you, you tell uh, your patient, which may be, you know, uh, uh, an eighth grade education. Your heart is flabby because, you know, and, and because it's flabby, you can't get enough <coughs> blood coming in and you can't get enough blood going out. And so you're getting dizzy and all the other symptoms that uh, come with congestive heart failure. Same thing with uh, climate change. Uh, if I may use an analogy, uh, we have a patient called Mother Earth. She has COPD. She has chronic bronchitis. She's got a, uh, uh, and so she's got an elevated level of CO2, and that causes her to her bloodstream to become uh, full of acid, acidotic, so to speak. So we have uh, higher acid in the. Do you mind not to to ask the question after this? You know, no, yeah, no. It was an interesting, you know, kind of analogy you make. So you have a question. Paul. What we have, no, I'm, I'm main, right now. I have tons of questions, but uh, right now we what we have to do is simplify this for the uh, uh, general public. 
uh, because uh, coming out with a bunch of data, let's say we have, uh, what, 385 parts per billion of CO2 where we had, what, 250, 200 years ago? Uh, I don't think that's going to cut it. Uh, uh, you, you have to I explain things in a more simplified context. And that's certainly not getting around the parochialism that surrounds this climate change. Yes, so do you have a question for... Uh, yeah, one question, okay, one quick question. I saw a couple of bar graphs uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, the, first, uh, the first bar graph that Andrew Droxler showed. Uh, it showed somewhere around between the 60s and the 70s, there was a decrease in temperature, and then somewhere around in the 80s, there's an increase. And I'm wondering if there's any correlation, do you have, uh, uh, see some correlation with uh, uh, the reduction of particulate matter in the atmosphere? Okay, that's a good question. And I think Mark, yeah, Mark, do you want to answer this question? Okay, I mean, one of the key things that we know is that there are two things driving the atmosphere. One is natural variability, including the sunspot cycle, which is on an 11-year cycle. So you'll notice that there are coolings during the 40s, the 60s, and what you find is that actually is driven by the natural cycles. And so if we were carrying on, you would get those nice decadal cycles occurring throughout uh, the next 100 years. However, what we're doing is putting on top of that the greenhouse effect, and which is then actually taking it up. And so that's one of the reasons why over the last, say, uh, 10 years, the temperatures have plateaued and haven't started to uh, increase markedly because there's a gentle natural forcing that's holding it back at the moment. And the key thing is that the models cannot reproduce the temperature curve unless you combine the natural cycles as well as the actual uh, anthropogenic. And it's the key thing about understanding both those cycles to actually understand how the temperatures are going to increase in the future. Thank you, Mark. I hate to say it, but I was a medical student too, but uh, <laughs> I, I, my, I've actually taken a meteorology course. And the problem to me with studying climate is a lot of things are counterintuitive. And my question is, do you think we in Houston should ever have meteorology courses like in the high schools? Or, uh, you know, I take continuing ed at Rice, and, and that I know of, there's, and I've taken a geology course and things, but there's never been a real meteoro meteorological course where we could take it in, in, in Houston, you know, and have a give and take. I mean, personally, you know, kind of, I, I have children, you know, in the public school system here, and they have had, you know, kind of some, you know, some courses in Earth system. It is true that, you no know, kind of, they have not, you know, kind of taken much, you know, courses in terms of meteorology. I'm not sure in the UK if uh, you are better educated in terms of, you know, kind of the climate or the, um, the atmosphere. Um, you're better at... Mark has kids, so he's much better at what our cu current <laughs> curriculum is than me. Um, I, I actually think that's a really nice idea. I, uh, you know, actually giving people the basic information on which to hang it is really, really important. I remember I, I was never taught in the UK, my schooling the kings and queens of England. I was never made to recite the damn things. You know, and if I'd had that list in my mind the whole of history would actually as a subject would be much easier because i had a skeleton a backbone for you medics on which to hang the ribs of events and and i think yeah giving people a fundamental understanding at quite an early stage of, of what the systems are would actually be a way to get a whole generation to understand this rather better than we do you know, as a generation so i think it's a fabulous idea yeah education to try to separate no kind of what what's climate versus weather which would be a good way, you know, kind of to, uh, to deal with this. Yes, please. Oh, first of all, as a former high school teacher, I can tell you that meteorology is taught in some of the high schools. But my, my question <coughs> has to do with melting of ice caps. Mm -hmm. And that is, what, <laughs> how much does particulate matter have to do uh, with the melting, like we've seen in China and India? Mm -hmm. so Very little, actually. Um, 
the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet especially uh, are you know, quite remote from particulate matter, um, especially the Antarctic. And there we are seeing changes and we are seeing loss. Actually, surprisingly, it's not driven primarily by atmospheric warming. It's driven by atmospheric changes causing ocean changes and the ocean delivering more heat to the ice in that respect. And I think that that's actually the dominant process for both Antarctica and Greenland. All of the glaciers, the mountain glaciers, which are closer to centres of civilization and centres of population and may have some you know, soot issue, um, are actually pretty easy to predict in the future. The biggest uncertainty for sea level rise is in those big ice sheets. Well, I'm going to go there. Would the panel agree that it would be uh, easier to convince the public to be environmentally responsible when they can show the reaction of that in their pockets? It's very, very expensive to be environmentally responsible. Just go to the grocery store and, and you look at the, the green products and they're four and five times more than the regular products. And the hybrid cars, I would love to have a Morgan there with the, um, <laughs> which is hybrid, I'd love to have a Morgan anyway, but uh, the, um, the, the vehicles, the hybrid vehicles are so much more expensive than a regular one and convincing the public, I think they're aware of it, but convincing them, would you agree that we're, we're, down. we're all going to want to have some say on this one, but you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, can I go first? Yeah, go for it, David. It, it costs people to ignore this. I sat next to somebody on the plane going down to Corpus Christi, and she said, Sea Level Rise Conference, oh, tell me about it. <laughs> and then she's in a place where already she understands sea level rise through the insurance issue, the house insurance issue. And that's an issue that we're going to see very, very quickly in the UK. There is an argument that we, you know, we can all make money out of climate change. And, you know, the Germans have the first um, plant which takes sand in at one end and chucks out solar panels at the other. And there's actually no plant, similar plant in even Japan. Um, they're preparing not because they get particularly large amounts of sunlight, but because they want to sell to Greece and Spain when you know, the European Union regulations come in. So I think, you know, there's, there is money to be made. And you are right that people feel it, they believe it, and they understand it most when they feel it in their pocketbooks. Um, we were asked just briefly, we were asked this morning about, well, what, what do we do about the people who don't believe in climate change and won't believe in climate change and want, you know, firmly resistant to it. My, my answer is wait 20 years. <laughs> they, they won't be asking scientists the question because every fisherman, every farmer, they will all be telling them that this is... Yeah. Uh, I think the only problem is well, if we wait 20 years, then we really will be up the pole. So, um, yeah, I agree. We, it, what I was talking to about about the smart meters was generating a lot of interest from a lot of people because it related to their pockets. So I think you're dead right. We we have, unfortunately, and I'm just the same. You know, I I respond to pounds, shillings, and pence. So I, I think it's interesting to reflect on the true cost of carbon, perhaps, which isn't a very popular issue to talk about. Um, but if you look, think about the current price of carbon, it's around about fifteen. I don't know, $20 a tonne, maybe a bit more. Um, a Stern Review and other economists, so we can't really trust economists, but I've, I've done the sums myself on the back of a fag packet. And if you lose, if you lose a lot of the world's um, future capability to, to, to do things, that's worth an awful lot of money. If you divide that capability by the amount of emissions that we're making, um, you come up with some quite big sums, around about £500 or... Seven hundred dollars or or more as a possibility could be lower, it could be higher if you had to you need nine tons in the u k probably need a few more here each year to heat your house if that cost you four and a half thousand quid or seven thousand dollars, you would be doing something about it now i'm not saying we should immediately bring in such swinging pricing, but all i'm trying to do is reflect the true perhaps the true cost of our emissions 
Uh, just quickly, can I just add to that? The other thing that I am always shocked about is we're in the middle of a recession. And if businesses actually looked at their energy usage and all of that, and they actually put in all the, um, the technology that they can, which is very cheap and very simple, they can save at least 25% of their fuel bills. And guess what? You don't have to make people redundant. The business school in Harvard in one year cut their energy bill, because they're incredibly competitive there, uh, by 25%. Okay, so again, it touches the bottom line of companies, and I'm always amazed that companies are always looking at their profit, but never look at their baseline. And that's something I go around trying to uh, make companies a bit more aware of why they're losing profit. Thanks, Mark. Yes. This is such a tremendously important subject, and you, you, you are, you've done such a great job in, in putting it on the table. Your numbers show that... Uh, in the last couple of years, I forget what the dates were, the number of people in the United States and Britain who don't believe things are happening increase. The number of people who were in favor of making changes and seeing long-term pictures decrease. Isn't that discouraging? And the, the question is, you know, in, in a deeper kind of way, you are dealing with with a tremendous inertia, if that's the right word, um, and you say we can't wait 20 years, well, <coughs> we're probably gonna wait 20 years. But there, so a couple of uh, questions. Do you, have you, scientists thought about, how do you, how do you do bring into your discussions um, psychologists? Uh, the, your, your, the, the people who might help you come up with the right kinds of, of, of motivations to make us change. I have lots of friends here in Houston, um, educated people, um, top business people, who don't want to hear what you're saying, I guess, because they don't pay attention to it. And, the, and these, these objectors, whom you see published all the time, and, you know, important people, important. Uh, David Brooks in the New York Times, um, uh, importantly listened to speakers, and uh, they, they, they want to focus on the objections to the things that you're saying and that we all believe is true. So wh what's the program that you guys have to, to change public opinion. Is this it? Just talk to us and hope that we're going to do something about it? Or do you bring, do you bring somebody? How do you do this? Well, I, I, that's what I was trying to reflect on. Um, I think it, it is difficult, but you've got to show leadership. I mean, our, the chair of our environment agency, who's Lord Chris Smith, he, he's, he's out there on the, on the stump, you know, giving the speeches. We've got climate change at the centre of our corporate strategy in the environment agency, and he's out there saying... You know, these papers shouldn't be printing stuff that's, that's misleading. So uh, it, it, it takes a lot of individual um, action and, and leadership to try and persuade people. But um, I think there's no magic bullet, unfortunately. We've all got to, get, we've all got to stand up and be counted and get uh, into the dialogue, as uh, David and others were saying. I mean, I have to say, I think it's much easier in our country because we have had a bipartisan agreement between the two major parties who have signed a law to say that the country will reduce their carbon emissions of 80% of 1990 levels by 2050. So once you've actually got the policy makers being brave enough to actually make a decision like that for future generations, then it's actually then easier to actually go to the population and say, well, this is what we're doing, but this is how you can help, and this is how we can get you into it. I also feel um, that there are a lot of top-down things that can be done. There, the population can be, um, how should I put it, allowed to help themselves. For example, in the United Kingdom, the inefficient light bulbs are going to be phased out and made illegal over the next few years. So therefore, people cannot help themselves, but actually have efficient light bulbs for their houses. And I think being able to do things like that actually changes the uh, ability for people to think about things. Because people are incredibly busy. 
People spend most of their time trying to think about how to get their kids into school, how to get to work, whether their boss is going to shout at them because they're late, how they're actually going to get a meal on the table. The last thing on their mind is climate change and what's going to happen to the planet in 30 years' time. So I think it's up to us as uh, or policymakers to actually try and allow them to make the right decisions for society and actually make it easier for them. Um, you asked direct question. Is it discouraging that the media especially is giving science such a hard time? Hell yes, it's discouraging. <laughs> it's really discouraging. But I actually take it as a positive sign that you know, people are attacking the science because the policy debate is now out there in the open and they've taken the science as being you know, an interesting <laughs> documentary program on TV for many years. They now realise it's serious. They have to discuss this and agree on it. And so, yes, some, of, some parts of the media have started to pick off the occasional personality and, and scientists, but there's plenty more of us you know, ready to stand up and say, I'm Spartacus, and if you <laughs> remember that film. And, you know, we're... They can't. They can't. They can pick off a few people, but they. There is a vast number of scientists here who are ready to discuss these issues in an open and honest way and get it on the table. And and it's because we're closer to having this as a really proper policy debate that it's all got a bit dirty. Yeah, a, a <clears throat> quick comment then a question. I'm somewhat astounded. Three scientists here at Rice, and there's. Uh, so little data actually presented. We saw basically one curve. There could have been zillions of curves. We have more. Hundreds of, you know, back to thousands and millions of years. But, but I have to say, this, this is about communicating climate change. It's not about us trying to convince you. So our remit here was to talk about how we can communicate climate change better. And actually, I have to say, sticking up loads of graphs with lots of data is the first thing to send people straight asleep. <laughs> Fair enough. That was my <laughs> comment, not such a yeah. question. Uh, the, the question revolves around life is full of changes and consequences. I was with a geologist at 7,000 feet in New Mexico, and it used to be underwater because of the fossils you could see there. No big news flash. And the consequences are you're making trade-offs all the time. And debating whether the climate will change seems to me to be ridiculous. The better question is what are the consequences and what are the trade-offs? And I, I don't really hear that coming out. The question about insurance up there, I mean that's a tip of the iceberg, but it seems like there could be a lot more. Can you address the consequences in a little bit broader systemic way? Um, Longer term? Well, I, you know, I, I assume you're alluding to adaptation, and, and that's that's just as important as mitigation. Um, one that I've been pushing personally for ten years at, at least. And ten years ago, when discussing this in London with the mayor's office, you know, it wasn't seen as a priority, and it now is. So, you're dead right. You know, we have to work out what the consequences will be. That we're not sure exactly how the climate is going to change but we know rough, the rough direction as I demonstrated with sea level and temperature and we need to be more resilient to those to those changes but we also have to mitigate because if we don't mitigate then we're again not going to be able to adapt to a really extreme climate change in the long term. I think you know to, to intrude a little bit onto Tim's expertise, I mean, in the UK, I used to go around and say, saying, did you know that the replacement of the Thames barrier may cost £20 billion? And that seemed like a big number until the year before last, we bailed out one bank with £50 million in one day. <laughs> and this, you know, the £20 billion would be spent over a decade at least. And so, you know, that's, that's a no-brainer. And I mean, it's, it's, in our, it's in our national policy that that money will be made available if we, yeah, it, when we need it. But there are other areas of the country which we can't defend, and we've, we're facing up to, you know, certain wetland environments in Norfolk and you know, pop, small, low population density areas that we are not going to defend. Now we've had, we're having that deba debate, and I think that this is a debate that's that is going on in Texas, maybe not quite so overtly, but it, it is certainly going on there, and. Uh, it's exactly the cost benefit analysis is exactly the thing that has to drive the policy. Okay. 
in that context. There's a uh, working group too, the IPCC made a really horrendously bad estimate that Himalayan glaciers would melt like in 30 years. And the, w, the working group one, which are the scientists, said no, that they knew this was wrong and told and they ignored it for policy reasons. Should the IPCC be split in two so that scientists and working group one are kind of saved from, you know, we're separated from poly decisions and the other working groups? I was actually attached to working group two. And so was I. <laughs> I, I, I will separate myself then. <laughs> uh, what an awful mistake. I mean, I, I, it's dreadful that that got through the review process, and I don't know the details of what happened in that chapter. One of the things I was interested to say to you is that the, the IPCC chapters, the big reports that you may have seen, the three working group reports, the words in there are the scientists' words, and warts and all, and that was a big wart. Um, they were not the consensus document of government. They weren't influenced by government. They were reviewed by governments, and we were advised in various cases. My suspicion is that that was a f must have been one of the you know the worst time, the most likely time to make a mistake is in the final revision, isn't it? And I suspect that that was added late on, and I certainly didn't see it. It's it was grim. However. It's a 923-page document, and honestly, that appears as one line. You know. oh. <laughs> there must be, you know, there must be 40 lines per page. That makes 40,000. You know, it is an enormously, uh, you know, we've taken a real magnifying glass to that. And frankly, if that's the best, mis the worst mistake we can find, then I'm still very proud to have done a good job. Can you tell us how many scientists were involved in policymakers? to make up you know, this last document? It depends. It's a, very, it's a big pyramid. I mean, there were uh, 20 chapters roughly per working group. Each chapter would have had about 10 authors, but then there were reviewers. And the, the, the IPCC stores all of the review material. For my chapter, which was a terribly uncontentious chapter, we had basically about 50 pages of text. And in the first review, we had 150 pages of comments. And they were mostly about, you know, uh, Australia says the comma's in the wrong place, Portugal says the comma's in the wrong place, OK, yeah, yeah, get it. <laughs> Spain says the comma's in the wrong place. But we had to respond, and there is a record of our responses to every one of those comments on... Um, are these public? I mean, you, you could go I, on I don't know whether they're actually, to, whether to they're actually public, but they are stored and they are you know, part you could. of the background research notes, if you like, of the IPCC, and I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be allowable to, um, to be accessed. So the process was you know, strong, but clearly not quite strong enough. God, there's so many hands. We have uh, until 6 o'clock, so you know, we still have a few you know, hands to answer, and... Mark, maybe, since I know you, you know, you have a question, yes? Well, um, you know, since this is about communication, you know, what, what I observe is there's a few things that, and I, and I am a skeptic denier, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, one of the great unwashed. So um, <laughs> one of the things that, that I see is there, there's a couple things that have been, been pretty significant in terms of why the communication challenge is so bad. Uh, one, I think there's been a lot of great scientific challenge from the other side, and frankly, with bold claims, you need bold proof and bold documentation. I think we'd all agree to that. Um, but those challenges really haven't been debated. They've been they've been put down, and there's just been a very harsh tone in the media. And I think this leads to the second issue, which is, you know, having someone like Al Gore as your lead spokesman, who's using tacit data points of pictures of polar bears on ice or things like that, it can be so easily debated with a winner like this. For example, I, mean, I don't think you want to get into a tacit data point debate, but unfortunately, the movement's <laughs> been married to that. And so it's probably very exciting at some point, you know, to have Al Gore up there, you know, leading. But at the end of the day, he wasn't really leading in a very intellectual way. And that's <laughs> undercut the whole communications issue, I believe. So I guess the question is, how do you get it from you know, boring scientists trying to deliver a communication uh, message. Uh, obviously, it's very tempting to have a sexy, well-recognized politician as that lead communicator, but if he does a poor job of communicating, then what have you really done? 
So I guess the question really is, how do you how do you fill that gap and not let the message get hijacked in a destructive way? I I would agree with you that actually the Al Gore movie, that, you know, was a two-edged sword. I mean, it, it engaged and it brought people to the debate in vast numbers, and I you know I thank it for that. However, I mean, if you look at a you, you and analyse it. I run a, a course in science communication, discuss, uh, policy making in, in Swansea University every year, and they did, the students discuss that movie. And it's not very long before somebody says, "How does these anecdotes about his, you know, his family tobacco farmers have anything to do with this this policy discussion?" And they don't. I mean, there's clearly you know something that's been suggested to put to put in as a fairly cynical attempt to. You know, show that he's a person who's had tragedy in his life. And, uh, you know, they are. It is a dual-edged sword. But there are no leaders in this debate more than there are leaders in any other of the global debates that we have. And uh, there are leaders by virtue of people who want to listen to them. I I actually think that we we don't necessarily need people who are so charismatic that their personality becomes the issue. And that's kind of what we've got with, with Al Gore. And I described it as a, a couple of times. You know, I'm not interested personally in discussing necessarily the policy outcomes. I want people to understand the science, nothing but the science as I see it. And I'm very willing to debate, especially if, we, if somebody will come along and stick to one debating point. You know, it's, it's easy to do. It's a difficulty, and I've seen it with Richard Linson, certainly, you know, he wants to discuss the whole lot in you know one 15 minute slot and you can't respond um, but I'm very happy to be a grey person in respect of not pushing my own personality or my own vision of the future forward and just sticking to the science you know, and me, that means suppressing a little bit your own personality not letting it shine through I'll wear a white coat if that's necessary. <laughs> I mean, to, to support David's point, that has been very successful in the British media. What you find is that a number of us will go on to the media and we will talk about the science in sort of that calm, rational way. We'll talk about the data being built up. And I have to say, even when you're debating with someone who turns around and says wonderful things like, it's subprime science. No, the science show you, you literally have to just keep your own tone going because every so they will suddenly throw you a curveball and go, well, we're just tarot card reading, aren't you? Uh, the science says... And so, again, it's just, yeah, I mean, Al Gore, at least he brought uh, sort of like a country to be aware of a problem. But now we have to actually have the really excellent scientists in the, uh, the USA be heard and actually f uh, see the science and how it's built up and how it's not actually um, a, a simple sort of uh, here you are, polar bear dying. And I agree with you. And I would say, you know, kind of, I'll go probably convinced the, peop the people in the U.S. who were already convinced and didn't make any difference, you know, and didn't really communicate, you know, kind of the, the science to the, the, the other half of the population. So it's kind of tough not to select no people. Wait, I've had my hand up a long time. You have? Okay, that's, that's very good. And I have an so, actual question, not a comment. Could you tell us a little bit about the bill in the U.K.? What does it tell people to do? <laughs> the the okay. climate change bill. Yes. yes. Okay. Right. <laughs> it doesn't tell anyone what to do. It basically mandates the government to put in policies in place to reduce the whole country's carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. There is a climate change committee which is then there, the great and the good, to actually oversee and to advise the government whether their policies are working. And at each, I think it's every five years, they will then turn around to the government and say, you've done this, 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 this has been successful, this hasn't, and actually 
you need to actually go back to the drawing board and add more in. So it's actually large scale things. So for example, we have a European trading scheme for carbon, which is mainly the energy and manufacturing industries. And that's actually a cap and trade that's slowly lowering down. So that's keeping uh, the energy sort of uh, carbon down. And so they're doing policies at this level to actually try to drive the whole countries down. So it doesn't mandate anything on the people, it's only on the politicians. And the other thing it does is uh, require the government to carry out a national risk assessment for the threats of climate change and how, uh, what the impacts would be. And it also requires uh, major undertakers and utilities to report back to government on how they're adapting to climate, ch climate change. Uh, through a separate route, local authorities um, are encouraged to look at the effects of climate change and to mitigate against climate change. So whilst... Um, some of the measures are not well designed, as Mark just said. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot of action that's actually starting on the ground. As I understand it, there are some actually some clauses in that climate change bill that relate the uh, government, the, the prime minister's remuneration, to success in this <laughs> meeting. <laughs> um, that may have been in the early draft that I saw, but <laughs> I'm sure hey, that's pretty effective. Yeah. We are dealing here with two types of systems. One is, is there a global warming? And how much? And how much it changes as a function of time and space? Secondly, is how much human activity is really contributing to that? This is an enormously complex scientific issue. Unfortunately, and I will use one of your terminology, it has gone from the deductive reasoning scientific domain, call it logic sometimes, to a belief debate domain. Now, human history is full of cases where when scientific issues go into the belief domain too soon, it produces a catastrophe. The earth is not flat, guys. <laughs> so, so, what do you think the scientific community, which has a big brain of putting it into the belief domain, should do to get it where <coughs> at this stage of understanding should be in the logic domain? There is, there is a section of the community for whom this will never enter the belief domain. You know, that there will be no until we get 20 years down the line and you know they feel it when they walk out of the door they will never believe it and so i think there is you know there is a section of the community we, we probably have to just leave behind on this um the proof that this is an exceptional thing that's happening is actually very simple um we have in the antarctic areas that used to be covered by 200 meter thick floating ice and those have retreated, those ice shelves have retreated, and when we go in and we grab sediment samples from the seabed, we can see that those ice shelves have been there in an unbroken fashion for 10,000 years. The temperature there in that part of the world is now in excess at any time in the previous 10,000 years. And there are many similar examples around the world of that kind of thing. They're not hugely publicised because their significance is actually a little bit subtle. But, you know, together, I don't think there's any doubt that we are in exceptional times. The connection between atmospheric warming and human interference is, you are right, a harder one. But, <coughs> for instance, the data from ice cores shows that carbon dioxide for the last 800,000 years has oscillated between, it doesn't even matter what the units are, 200 units to 280 units. And when it was 200 units, the Earth was, North America was covered by ice, England was covered by ice, or Scotland was covered by ice, and just raising to 280 from 200 made the difference between a planet that was 8 degrees centigrade cooler than now, and since the Industrial Revolution, we've raised the carbon dioxide level from 280 to 380. And that's a huge difference and that's the primary control on temperature on the planet so I 
I agree it is a harder thing to prove, but I think that there is enormous evidence there that it is anthropogenic, it is human-induced change. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a petroleum engineer. I'm not sure, quite sure why I was invited here, but uh, I have a question on the panel and then a comment. And the question is, we, we've been told that the uh, argument connecting CO2 to significant changes in, in the temperature uh, is over. And does the panel believe that? That's no longer a scientific argument? That uh, there is that connection and it's, it's serious enough that we need to uh, pass laws that are, will completely change our lifestyle? Yeah. Uh, the comment is that in our industry we have reservoir simulators are big black boxes just like your global simulators and it's very easy to match history you put enough knobs on a simulator and you can match it, any kind of history the trick is predicting the future because if the physics is not right then your prediction is all wrong Okay, I'll start off. I mean, I, I'm happy to admit that I was a marine geologist to start off with and therefore have worked on the deep sea Amazon fan and have worked with oil companies. I think the great thing about being a geologist is having that long sweep, we can actually tie in both uh, positions of the continents, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to periods of extreme warming on the Earth. And I think the nice thing is giving us that viewpoint give us that understanding that carbon dioxide is intimately linked to the actual temperature of the planet. And I think that's really a, quite a great um, point to be in. And you're right. That's why there's errors in the model. Because each model actually has a different uh, view of how carbon dioxide will warm the atmosphere and the feedbacks that will actually either enhance or dampen that down. And this is why if uh, anybody gives you a model, okay, and say, this is the future, automatically disbelieve them. The reason is it's the weight of evidence because there are 23 supercomputer teams around the world who have spent the last 25 years doing this. They all go in the same direction. They all actually have similar magnitudes. So the exactness is very difficult to pin down, but you get that feeling. And I have to say, to reply to you, the oil companies have been very good at finding oil, so their models aren't that rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, I wonder whether you've considered, uh, when trying to persuade people of the reality of uh, global warming, considered just explaining the physics of it rather than going into all the, the statistics, because I think I found it much more effective to just explain mechanism of how it happens because people actually understand <coughs> that better than they understand statistics yeah. and you get you when you talk about the statistics you get all sorts of objections you know like 1998 was hotter and all sorts of other things and how do you know it's man-made um, there's a whole series of things objections and it also feeds into a common I found a lot of people most people seem to think that we've noticed that the, the temperature is rising and we're scrabbling around looking for a a, a solution to it, or a reason for it. If you tell them that, that we've been known about this since 1890-something, um, or by some accounts, 1850-something, um, they have a whole different attitude to it. It was predicted long before it happened, and people don't know that. There's a wonderful uh, sorry Tim. There's a wonderful experiment which I've seen, which I, I do actually uh, talk to sort of uh, the public about, which is if you have a, a vacuum and you have a heat camera and you have a candle. On the camera, you can see the heat of the actual sort of candle. You turn a knob and you actually add a little bit of carbon dioxide into that vacuum. It absorbs the heat, it disappears from the camera. It's, I absolutely agree with you. The simple physics that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere absorbs heat is the first starting point for any of those communications. Tim. Well, yeah, I, I think you, you made a very good point. I mean, I was getting so depressed about the debate recently that I went back and looked at what Arrhenius said in, in 1890 and he summed the sit situation up very simply uh, that uh, if we increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere we, the temperature will go up if we didn't have any CO, CO2 in the atmosphere the temperature would be about uh, 30 or 35 degrees lower than it is now and I use, sometimes use the simile um, that uh, of, of putting in the blanket a blanket on your bed if you're in bed you normally have one blanket. 
if for some reason you decide to get you're getting a bit cold and you get out another blanket you've got double the insulation you feel perfectly okay for about two two or three hours and then you think it's getting too damned hot in here <laughs> the trouble with um, the, the the planet is you can't put the damn blanket back in the drawer <laughs> I agree, you've got a very good point. You should be up here. That's really... No, it's, it's, it, for a scientist, the, demonstrating the mechanism creates the expectation that if carbon dioxide rises, then the planet should warm up. You know, that's, that's what you understand by understanding the process. But of course, then for us, the big deal is, well, is it? And that's why we do focus a little bit overly much on perhaps on the data rather than the mechanism behind it. But you do need to understand that. One does need to understand that. So I think it's a really good point. Yeah. yeah. I found it interesting that in each of your brief remarks you brought up the weather that we've had in the past month or in the past year. You know, uh, so often when climate comes up in the media, it's in the context of the latest heat wave or the latest blizzard or hurricane. And what do you see as the role of discussing the most immediate and newsworthy weather in the context of the multi-decadal climate change? It's really frustrating because every time we get something in the UK you know, that's above average, then we're asked whether this is climate warming, you know, and, it, and it never is. And it, it, it's a hugely and, you know, high tide. You know, is this storm surge, is that, is that sea level rise? I mean, it's just really difficult, because we can never put our hand on our heart and honestly say that event would not have happened if we had not had uh, sea level rise or climate change. And it's a really, really difficult issue to, to respond to, because it's a it's a kind of knee-jerk reaction. Let's get some scientist on the phone and tell us whether the heat wave is climate change. Or yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. Um, but we can point out the increasing unlikeliness, unlikeliness of the events. I mean, the, rain, the rainstorm, uh, the rainstorm we had on Cockermouth, which is in northwest England recently. If you assume the climate is stationary, um, would be a one in a five thousand year event. However, and other studies looked at the change in the average rainfall over the, the between sort of uh, 1920 and 1980, I think, or roughly, and then the average between 1980 and, and now, and there's been a 25% increase in the average. If you then remodel that, the likelihood of that event with the changed average, you get something like uh, 1 in 100 or 1 in 200, which seems a bit more likely. I'm still not, you still can't say that's due to climate change, but you can talk through the stats and say the chances of this damn thing happening uh, are extremely rare. You know, London is protected against a one in a thousand year event. We think we're very safe. Holland is the whole country of Holland is protected against a one in ten thousand year event. And Cockermouth had a one in a five thousand year event, poor old Cockermouth. Of course, Tim will say that to the journalist and then the journalist will write the headline that says climate change, few water scorcher. Mm. <laughs> it I mean, always ends yeah, up being, yeah. you know... I mean, I, I have to say it's, uh, it is a nightmare because, uh, for example, I was on the media after Hurricane Katrina and you're almost uh, hoisted by your own honesty because they're asking you quite clearly, sort of like, is this climate change? And you have to actually, and again, with the media, you have to make sure you breathe in the right places so they can't cut you. Um, <laughs> I've done this a lot. Um, but the key thing is that if you, if you are going to keep your integrity as a scientist, you have to say, no, I'm sorry, individual events cannot actually show climate change. However, we think that these events may come more common in the future. But again, it's a nightmare, because what they really want you to say is, Absolutely, I think it's due to climate change. Okay, we will take you know, one mo more question, and after this, as we know, there will be a reception, so you will have plenty of chance and opportunities you know, kind of to ask your question. Yes, I'm going to, to ask what He has been very patient. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the, the, the subject today and hearing some of the feedback, I was wondering if the challenge is not really uh, just communication, but a marketing challenge. Uh, for instance, uh, if I can get a meter 
in my home that's going to save energy and save me money, I'd have one in a second and be asking for it. Do we not want to get it to the point where the public is asking for things that are not only good for the climate, but good for them? I mean, that's the real challenge. Is how do we get that out there so the public says, I want one of those, or I want to do that, versus, oh, I understand or don't understand or I'm confused. I think that should be the end result. I think, I think personally, you're dead right. I mean, I've been trying to uh, push this, you know, the, the pull argument rather than the push argument. There's too many of us saying you've got to do this. You've got to make it attractive. And that's the really encouraging thing about this thing we're doing in London, as people are saying, you know, on these home visits, people are saying, oh, I want my home visit, you know, I want my free meter, and, you know, and they're all saying, and the great thing about this is it's free. So I think you're dead right. You know, we need to be designing products that retrofit your house, that are sexy, and sort out climate change. Why does my wife sitting in the, in the audience, why did I spend £5,000 improving my bathroom? I'm not quite sure. It's because she wanted. It's because she wanted it. <laughs> it's not the time or the place, Jim. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but if it were, if if we, if the uh, marketplace was selling a really sexy, you know, green solution, you know, maybe there's there's a lot of truth in that in that argument. I mean, to answer that, I think that it's getting different groups of people on board. Last year, the Lancet Journal asked us to actually do a report on climate change and global health. And because the medics have been one of the last groups of uh, scientists to actually engage with climate change and understand it. And so the interesting thing was, when they do... you Excuse me. Sorry. Thank you. Um, it's like having an undergraduate class. Um, <laughs> except they're not kissing in the back row. <sighs> but the key, the key thing there was, as soon as the medics understood the physics, the uh, threats, etc., their eyes lit up. <gasps> we love a low-carbon world. Sorry? Well, look, it means that you have to use the car less, use bikes. <gasps> We can cure obesity. Right, we can do it. We, we, we have to l l eat less meat because meat actually is a high carbon, so people have to become more vegetarian. Great, we can cure heart. Again, it's, you're right, it's producing these win-win scenarios with our health, with businesses, with our environment, and it, it's key there. It's always win-win. One of my own personal bugbears is forestation and reforestation. There are many countries in the world who have deforested their country due to economic necessity, particularly in Africa. What happens is they lose their ecological services. Their soils disappear and the rainfall becomes uh, less regular and less predictable. If they reforested that area, A, they get all those back. The agriculture would be much more sort of like uh, sustainable, less famines, Oh, and we also made a huge carbon gain. And I think that's the key thing that policymakers have to think about. And this is going back to David's view, which is the cost-benefit analysis. We don't do it just because uh, it's climate change. We do it because there's a societal gain as well, and we can make a win-win situation in each one of those cases. Well, on these really positive words, I think it's a good way, you know, kind of to translate, you know, to the reception. But before we do this, first we like, you know, kind of to thanks, you know, Tim, David, and Mark, the trio from England. <laughs> we like also you know, to thank you know, the Baker Institute you not know, to bring you know, this event to us, but also you know, to the uh, General Cons Consul, uh, Consulate of Switzerland, and especially you know, May, who organized all this event, and Catherine, I don't know if Catherine is in, in the audience, but this, you know, kind of, it's interesting that you no know, kind of a consul a consul general from the UK you know, here can bring so many of us from Texas and from Houston together. And um, before you know, we clap you know, for May, I also mention, we want to mention that the Swiss consulate, and as you might have heard, that I do have an accent and I was born and raised in Switzerland. I've lived in Houston for a long time. But on the 9th of April, the Swiss consul, consulate and CSCS, our center, have Co are going to co-host an interesting event. A Swiss scientist is coming, Conrad Steffen, who has been working on the Greenland ice sheets for the past 35 years, is going to give a public lecture here in Duncan Hall. So I invite you, you know, to come and, and uh, with us, you know, in the Swiss consulate, you know, kind of to, to attend you know, this event. But thanks very much, May, for a great you know, debate.